Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Before we begin, a short prayer. All blessing, honor, glory, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, for now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. I pray to Almighty God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so my power to speak truth without error, and to interpret Holy Scripture correctly. All truth comes from God. Any errors are my own. I also pray that you, the viewer and listener, may likewise be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that any truth I speak or any scripture that I interpret correctly is welcome to your heart, your mind, and your soul. Today's discussion is in the False Teachings at JW.org playlist and is entitled, What Happens When We Die? So here we are at JW.org. What does the Bible say? What happens when we die? Some people believe that we live on in another form, while others feel that death is the end of everything. What do you believe? What the Bible says, the dead know nothing at all. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. When we die, we cease to exist. What else we learn from the Bible? The first man, Adam, returned to the dust when he died. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 and Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. Likewise, all others who die return to the dust. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. So let's look further into these verses that the Watchtower uses to suggest that we cease to exist after we physically die. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. This is the New World Translation, jw.org, except verses 4 through 6, not just verse 5. There is hope for whoever is among the living, because a live dog is better off than a dead lion. That's true. While our bodies, these current bodies we inhabit, are physically alive, we can do things, and when we're physically dead, we can't. And that's why a live dog who can do things is better off than a dead lion. Now the verse, for the living know that they will die. But the dead know nothing at all, nor do they have any more reward because all memory of them is forgotten. Let's read verse 6. Also, their love and their hate and their jealousy have already perished, and they no longer have any share in what is done under the sun. Notice the end of verse 6 is kind of like what verse 4 says. Again, while we are in these physical bodies that are alive, we can do things. We can have a share in what is done under the sun. When these physical bodies die, we can't. Notice our love and our hate and our jealousy in these physical lives that we currently uh, exist in will perish with those physical bodies. Our memory will be forgotten. We don't have any more reward in what happens in this current physical dimension. But does that necessarily mean we cease to exist, right? For the living know that they will die, right? Right now we're both alive. We have brain activity. When these bodies die and when we're lying in the ground, there will be no longer activity happening in those brains. But again, does that necessarily mean we cease to exist? Not necessarily. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, And Jehovah God went on to form the man out of dust from the ground and to blow into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living person. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, Then the sweat of your face, this is the Lord God speaking to Adam, You will eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Yes, we're made out of physical material, and when we die, our physical material, well, possibly, right, uh, re-enter the rest of uh, such physical material in this uh, created universe. But again, does that necessarily mean we cease to exist? No. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, not, let's not just look at 19 and 20, let's look at verses 18 through 22. I also said in my heart about the sons of men that the true God will test them and show them that they are like animals. Yes, we are in physical bodies like animals. For there is an outcome for humans and an outcome for animals. They all have the same outcome. That's right. These physical bodies die, humans, animals. As the one dies, so the other dies. And they all have but one spirit. So man has no superiority over animals, for everything is futile. Hmm. So God wants us to think everything is futile. Remember, in the Bible... When individuals speak things, right? They're the truth. God wants us to understand that. But does, that doesn't necessarily mean that what they're saying is what God wants us to believe. Does God want us to believe that everything is futile? Of course not. All are going to the same place, right? All our bodies are going to physically die. They all come from the dust and they all returning to the dust like we saw in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. Notice verse 21 though. Who really knows whether the spirit of humans ascends upward and whether the spirit of animals descends down to the earth? Who? So there's something different about our spirit and our body 
that um, Solomon's talking about right there, and the watchtower denies that, so no wonder they don't mention verse 21. And I saw that there's nothing better than for a man to find enjoyment in his work because that is his reward, for who can enable him to see what will happen after he is gone, okay? Now, again, look at verse 21. He's basically stating that after we physically die, our spirit might go somewhere, proving there's a separation between what the spirit is and what the body is. And um, notice how verse 22 ends. Who can enable him? Well, God can do it. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Who has ascended to heaven and then descended? Who has gathered the wind in the palms of both hands? Who has wrapped up the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Obviously, Lord God. What is his name? And the name of his son, if you know. Nice verse proving that even before Lord Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there was a son of God, a divine, eternal uh, son of God. And again, who can know these things? Well, God knows these things. And again, everything is futile. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. The words of the congregator, the son of David, the king in Jerusalem, right? Solomon. The greatest futility, says the congregator. Here's Solomon speaking. The greatest futility. Everything is futile. Again, so even though Solomon said these words, and obviously it's kind of a depressing spirit in some of these verses uh, spoken of by King Solomon in Ecclesiastes, right? That doesn't mean God wants us to think that everything is futile. Similarly, please, when you look at these statements of Solomon and Ecclesiastes, recognize that King Solomon said these things and God wants us to understand what he said, but it doesn't mean that that's what God wants us to think because God obviously does, doesn't want us to think that everything is futile. And again, that we see over there in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 21, who really knows whether the spirit of humans descends upwards and whether the spirit of animals descends down to the earth? Solomon didn't know, but Lord God knows. So what does that prove? Solomon didn't know things that Lord God knows. And even in inspired writings here, he made those statements. So I don't think we can look at these verses and take from it that when we die, we cease to exist. Let's continue. People who die are quitted of or pardoned for their sins. Romans chapter 6, verse 7. There is no further punishment for sin after a person dies. Let's look right into this because this is really bad. And just this shows that the Watchtower doesn't understand Scripture whatsoever. Uh, no, notice how they interpreted that. Romans chapter 6. Let's look at verses 1 through 7 here to see what dying means. What are we to say then? Should we continue in sin so that undeserved kindness may increase? Certainly not. Seeing that we die with reference to sin, how can we keep living any longer in it? So what he's talking up of is baptism. Dying, right, with Christ in baptism, and your sin dies with you, and you're pardoned from your sins. So this is nothing to do with that wicked interpretation over there in the upper left. Let's continue. Uh, certainly not. Seeing that we die in reference to sin, how can you keep living any longer with it, yes? Or do you not know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Just like I said, so we were buried with him through our baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised up from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in a newness of life following baptism when we're pardoned from our sins. If we have become united with him in the likeness of his death in baptism, we will certainly also be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old personality was nailed to the stake along with him in order for our sinful body to be made powerless so that we should no longer go on being slaves to sin. For the one who has died has been acquitted from his sin. Died spiritually in baptism. So baptism, we achieve remission from our sins, and the old man dies and is nailed to the cross. Continue verses 8 through 11. Moreover, if we have died with Christ in baptism, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that Christ, now that he has been raised up from the dead, dies no more. Death is no longer master over him. For the death that he died, he died with reference to sin once for all time, but the life that he lives... He lives with reference to God. Likewise, you consider yourselves to be dead with reference to sin, but living with reference to God by Christ Jesus. So these are obviously physically alive individuals in Rome that St. Paul is writing to and communicating with. Right? So they were not physically dead, but they had been baptized. They were believers. They were reborn in the Spirit. Do you understand so? 
obviously, that interpretation uh, at uh, JW.org regarding Romans chapter 6, verse 7 is beyond wrong and actually pathetic. Can the dead live again? What would you say? Yes, no, maybe, what the Bible says. There is going to be a resurrection, Acts chapter 24, verse 15. What else can we learn from the Bible? The Bible often compares death to sleep. John chapter 11, verses 11 through 14. God can awaken the dead just as we can awaken a person from sleep. Job chapter 14, verse 13 to 15. The Bible records several resurrections, thus giving us a solid basis for believing that the dead will be raised up. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17 to 24. Luke chapter 7, verse 11 through 17. John chapter 11, verse 39 to 44. That's also, as you're going to see here, completely wrong in what they're suggesting. Those are God raising people from the dead. There's only been one resurrection. That's Lord Jesus, and I'll show that to you. But let's first look at Acts chapter 24, verse 15. And I have hope toward God, which hope these men also look forward to, that there is going to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. See, the resurrection is going to be in the future. The only one who's been resurrected so far is Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 25. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep in death. First fruits, right? He's the first. For since death came through a man, resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all are dying, so also in the Christ all will be made alive. See, the resurrection's in the future. But each one in his own proper order. Christ the first fruits. Ah, so the first resurrection was Lord Jesus Christ in A.D. 33. Uh, afterward, those who belong to the Christ during his presence or his coming or his appearing, that's in that rapture event uh, described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Uh, you see it uh, described in Revelation 6 with the uh, end event in Revelation 7, and you have perfect description of it in Revelation 14. Uh, next, the end last day when he hands over the kingdom to his God and Father when he is brought to nothing all government and all authority and power for he must rule as king until God has put all enemies under his feet you see that play out in Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 through 6 and then verses 11 through 15 so notice kind of three of these resurrection events the first was Lord Jesus Christ what does that mean things that happened before that weren't resurrections they were distinct and we'll go into more details coming up and then the rapture event and then the last day uh, described in revelation chapter 20 as i mentioned continuing first corinthians chapter 15 verse 26 to 28 and the last enemy death is to be brought to nothing for god subjected all things under his feet but when he says that all things have been subjected it is evident that this does not include the one who subjected all things to him. But when all things will have been subjected to him, then the Son himself will also subject himself to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all things to everyone. Again, that plays out in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, as I mentioned. Continuing, verses 29 to 34. Otherwise, what will they do who are being baptized for the purpose of being dead ones? If the dead are not to be raised up at all, why are they also being baptized for the purpose of being such? Why are we also in danger every hour? Daily I face death. This is as sure as my exaltation over you, brothers, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. If, like other men, I have fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, of what good is it to me? If the dead are not to be raised up, let us sing and drink, for tomorrow we are to die. Do not be misled. Bad associations spoil useful habits. Come to your senses in a righteous way and do not practice sin. For some have no knowledge of God. I am speaking to move you to shame. Continuing verses 35 to 41. Nevertheless, someone will say, how are the dead to be raised up? Yes, with what sort of body are they coming? Oh, when we're resurrected, we have a body? You unreasonable person, what you sow is not made alive unless first it dies. Like a seed, right? You put a seed into the ground. And then it is turned into something else later. And as for what you sow, you sow not the body that will develop, but just a bare grain, whether of wheat or of some other kind of seed. But God gives it a body just as it has pleased him. He gives to each of the seeds its own body. Not all flesh is the same flesh. Ooh, flesh, bodies. But there's one of mankind. There's another flesh of cattle, another flesh of birds, another of fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. All these are made out of physical material. But the glory of the heavenly bodies is one sort, and that of the earthly bodies is a different sort. 
The glory of the sun is one sort, and the glory of the moon is another, and the glory of the stars is another. In fact, one star differs from another star in glory. Continuing verses 42 to 49. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. So we have a corruptible body now. It is raised up in incorruption. When we're resurrected, we're going to have an incorruptible body. Lord Jesus has an incorruptible body. It is sown in dishonor, what we have now. It is raised up in glory. The resurrected body raised in glory, like Lord Jesus has. It is sown in weakness. We have a weak body now. It is raised up in power, powerful body, like Lord Jesus has right now. It is sown a physical body. It is raised up a spiritual body. If there's a physical body, there's also a spiritual one. See, this is all talking about flesh and bone, by the way, bodies. See, right now we have a flesh and blood corruptible body, uh, sown in dishonor, sown in weakness, sown a physical body, right? And we're going to have a flesh and bone spiritual body, which will be raised in incorruption, raised in glory, raised in power, raised a spiritual body. Verse 45, so it is written, the first man Adam became a living person. The last Adam, Lord Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. He will give us spiritual life. Our bodies will be powered by the spirit. However, our resurrected bodies, what is spiritual is not first. What is physical is first, and afterward, what is spiritual, right? The first thing we have right now is our physical body. Later, afterward, we're going to have a spiritual body. The first man, Adam, is from the earth and made of dust. The second man, Lord Jesus Christ, the last Adam, is from heaven, right? He came down from heaven. Like the one made of dust, so too are those made of dust. That's us right now. And like the heavenly one, so too are those who are heavenly. We're going to be made in the future like Lord Jesus is with his flesh and bone spiritual body. And just as we have borne the image of the one made of dust, right? We now bear the image of Adam. We will bear also the image of the heavenly one. We will bear a flesh and bone spiritual body. That's the resurrected body. Notice it's a body. It's distinct from this body, but it's a flesh body. It is made out of physical material. Now again, it's gonna be a flesh and bone body. It's gonna be a spiritual body. It's going to be an incorruptible body. It's going to be raised in glory, raised in power, etc. Verses 50 through 57. But I tell you this, brothers, that flesh and blood, that's the current body we have right now, cannot inherit God's kingdom, nor does corruption inherit incorruption, right? We have a corruptible body right now. Look, I tell you a sacred secret. We will not all fall asleep in death, but we will all be changed. This is described in more detail in 1 Thessalonians 4, in a moment, in the blink of an eye, during the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised up incorruptible, their dead bodies, and we will be changed. So he's talking about those, those alive at that time. Again, described in more detail in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Spirits of righteous ones made perfect will come down with Lord Jesus, this is in 1 Thessalonians 4, and the dead bodies will rise, will be reunited with those spirits in a twinkling, turned into these spiritual bodies. And then we who remain, those living believers, we will be raised up into the clouds and we'll be changed too. Uh, again, that's in 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, for this which is corruptible must put on incorruption and this which is mortal must put on immortality. The spiritual body will be an immortal body. But when this which is corruptible puts on incorruption, this which is mortal puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death is swallowed up forever. Death was your victory because our body will no longer be able to die. And that proves that those other events weren't resurrections because when you have a resurrection, that body, that spiritual body raised in power is immortal, can't die. Death was your victory. Death was your sting. The sting producing death is sin and the power for sin is the law. But thanks to God, for he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 24. Here's the flesh and bone body of Lord Jesus. Verses 36 to 43. When they were speaking of these things, he himself stood in the midst and said to them, this is following the resurrection. Uh, uh, these are the disciples. May you have peace. But because they were terrified and frightened, they imagined they were seeing a spirit. See, they thought they were seeing a spirit. They were seeing a spiritual body. So he said to them, why are you troubled? And why have you have doubts come up in your hearts? See my hands and my feet. Why? Because he would have the wounds of the nails. 
that is, I myself, touch me and see he has a body. For spirit does not have flesh and bone. See, it's a flesh and bone body, as I described it, to distinguish it from the flesh and blood body that's corruptible that we have now, just as you see that I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they were still not believing for sheer joy and amazement, he said to them, do you have something there to eat? See, they still didn't believe that he had this body, that he was physically alive. Now, it's different from the body they had and the body we have and the body Lord Jesus had in the past, right? Because it was, again, this resurrected body. But what is he going to do? He's going to eat food, again, to prove I'm in a body. I can eat food. So they handed him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before their eyes. There's his resurrected body. Only one entity has a resurrected body. That's Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son who took on flesh, right? He had a flesh and blood body, Right, made in the nature of Adam, lower than angels. Now he has the flesh and bone spiritual body made greater than the angels. Why is it lower than the angels? Because it can die. Angels can't die. Why is it greater than the angels? It can't die. And it rules over the angels as we will. We will judge the angels, right? John chapter 20, verse 26 to 30. Well, eight days later, again, here's the resurrection in, in John. His disciples were again indoors and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and he stood in the midst and said, may you have peace. See, he just did a miracle right there, right? The doors are locked and he physically materialized himself. Again, he's in a body. Next, he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and take your hand, stick it into my side. He's touching physical material and stop doubting, but believe. So he's showing him the wounds of the nails in his hands. He's showing him the wound of the spear in his side. And answer, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, o kyrios mu, the Lord of me, keo theos mu, and the God of me. Thomas just declared him his Lord and his God. Wow. Why do I say that Lord Jesus Christ is my Lord and my God? Well, Thomas said it. Why did Thomas say it? Because he did things that no man could do. He materialized himself in a room. He told Thomas what Thomas had said earlier to the disciples when he wasn't physically there, right? And he resurrected himself just like he promised in uh, John chapter 2, right? In three days, I will raise the temple of my body. And that's why Thomas declared what he declared, my Lord and my God. Notice Jesus doesn't rebuke him. He accepts it. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Happy are those who have not seen and yet believe. So he's seen him resurrect himself. He's seen him material himself materialize himself in a room. He's seen him respond back with his challenge, right? Because he heard what he said when he wasn't even physically in the room at the time. Why? Because he's omnipresent and he's omnipotent and he's omniscient, right? Because he's God, right? So that's why Thomas believed that he was his Lord and his God. Notice, happy are those who have not seen and yet believe. Believe what? That Lord Jesus Christ is is their Lord and their God. See, I'm happy because I know and I believe that Lord Jesus is okidiosmu, keotheosmu, the Lord of me and the God of me. See, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're not happy because you don't see and believe that. You've been told lies. To be sure, Jesus also performed many other signs before the disciples, which are not written down in the scroll, many other signs. These are signs, miracles, What were the signs that Thomas just witnessed that uh, St. John is writing about? Lord Jesus materializing in the room and Lord Jesus, you know, you know, uh, responding to the challenge of of Thomas proving again his uh, divine characteristics characteristics of omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence. Um, But these have been written down, these signs, these miracles, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, And because of believing, you may have life by means of his name, the name of the divine son who took on flesh. Again, notice his resurrected body, body, body. John chapter 14, verse 6. And remember, Jesus can't lie. If you think, oh, that really wasn't his body. What, he was tricking them? Wicked. John chapter 14, verse 6 to 7. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you met and known me, you would have known my Father also. From this moment on, you know him and have seen him. Wow. If you see Lord Jesus, you see the Father. He is the perfect image of his Father. He is the divine Son who took on flesh. He can't lie. He's not a trickster. So when he told the disciples in uh, Luke 24, and when he told Thomas in John chapter 20, 
and he showed him the wounds in his hands and his feet. He showed him the wounds in his hand and his side. To think that that wasn't his body changed is wicked, and he'd be a liar, and Lord Jesus can't lie. He's the divine son who took on flesh. He is the truth. The watchtower is the liar. John chapter 5, verse 25 to 29. Most truly I say to you, the hour is coming, and it is now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who have paid attention will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he's granted also to the Son to have life in himself. Wow. Life in himself, Father and Son, right? Eternal life are in them. And he's given him authority to do judging because he is the Son of Man. So Lord Jesus does the judging. And again, we see that play out in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 6, and then verses 11 through 15. Do not be amazed at this, for the hour is coming, in which all those in the memorial tombs will hear his voice, the voice of the Son of Man, the voice of the Lord Jesus, the divine Son who took on flesh, and come up, those who have done good things to a resurrection of life, and those who have practiced vile things to a resurrection of judgment. So there's going to be a resurrection for everyone. Resurrection of life or resurrection of judgment. Matthew chapter 25. We're going to see it here in the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Verses um, 31 to 33 here. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit down on his glorious throne. This is the um, great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. They will, these will all be existing and he will put the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left. Verses 34 to 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you have been blessed by my father, and inherit the king to prepare for you from the founding of the world. For I became hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and received me hospitably. Naked, and you clothed me. I fell sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous ones will answer him with the words, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and receive you hospitably, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? In reply, the king will say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to the to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Who are his brothers? Who are his sisters? Who are his mother? Those who follow the will of his father in heaven. What's the will of the father? That's in John chapter 6, verse 40. To see and believe upon the son, right? Well, if I'm going to see and believe upon the son, why do I need to see and believe? We just saw it. In John chapter 20, we need to see and believe that he's our Lord and our God. So brothers and sisters and mother of Lord Jesus are those who see him for who he truly is, their Lord and their God, the divine son who took on flesh. See, I'm a brother. You as a Jehovah's Witness are not a brother, right? You don't see and believe upon him as he truly is because the watchtower has lied to you and taught you wicked satanic lies. Continuing verse 41 to 46. Then he will say to those on his left, go away from me. You have been cursed into the everlasting fire. Fire forever. Prepare for the devil and his angels. For I became hungry, but you gave me nothing to eat. And I was thirsty, but you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, but you did not receive me hospitably. Naked, but you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, but you did not look after me. Then they too will answer with the words, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of, of these least ones of my brothers, you did it. You did not do it to me. So notice, if you're a sheep, all you have to do to inherit everlasting life is one time do one good deed for a brother of Lord Jesus. What's a brother of Lord Jesus or a sister or mother who sees and believes upon him as their Lord and their God? If you're a goat, that's all you have to do is every single time you interact with a, 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 a brother of Lord Jesus, again, one who sees and believes upon him as your Lord and your God, right? Which would not be a Jehovah's Witness, by the way. You have to do that every single time. And if you miss it one time, you're going to go into everlasting judgment, everlasting destruction, actually. These will depart into everlasting cutting off, but the righteous ones into everlasting life. Revelation chapter 20. I mentioned it earlier. Let's look at these verses, verse 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne. This is the glorious throne of Lord Jesus we just saw in, um, in Matthew. And the one seated on it, right, Lord Jesus Christ doing the judging, from before him the earth and the heaven fled away and no place was found for them. They're destroyed, right? The old heaven and the old earth are destroyed right before the face of Lord Jesus 
right there. You see this described in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 11 through 12, for example. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. Wait a minute. I thought dead means you don't exist, but the dead are standing. <laughs> okay? So it doesn't mean what you think it means. And scrolls were opened. But another scroll was opened. It is the scroll of life. The dead were judged out of those things written in the scrolls according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead in it, and death and the grave gave up the dead in them, and they were judged individually according to their deeds. And death and the grave were hurled into the lake of fire. This means the second death, the lake of fire. Furthermore, whoever was not found written in the book of life was hurled into the lake of fire. John chapter 11. Now let's go back to what we see over there at jw.org near the bottom. We're looking at verses 11 through 16. See, this is not a resurrection. This is raising someone from the dead, we're going to see. After he said these things, he added, Lazarus, our friend, has fallen asleep, but I'm traveling there to awaken him. The disciples then said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will get well. Jesus, however, had spoken about his death, his physical death. He still existed, but they imagined he was speaking about him taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus has died, physically died. He existed. And I rejoice for your sake that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Believe what? That he's... <laughs> He's going to do a sign here that he's their Lord and their God. We again see that in John 20, 28. So Thomas, oh, here's Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. So he misunderstood Lord Jesus right there, didn't he? Luke chapter 8, verses 49 to 55. Pay attention to this. While he was yet speaking, a representative of the presiding officer of the synagogue came, saying, your daughter has died. Do not bother the teacher any longer. On hearing this, Jesus answered him, Have no fear, only have faith, and she will be saved. When he reached the house, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, James, and the girl's father and mother. But people were all weeping and beating themselves in grief for her. So he said, Stop weeping, for she did not die but is sleeping. At this they began to laugh at him scornfully. Oh, she's dead. She doesn't exist anymore. Because they knew that she had died. But he took her by the hand and called to her, Child, get up. Pay attention to the next verse. And her spirit returned. Ooh, well, her spirit returned. Remember, the spirit, where does it go? It's distinct from the body. So her spirit, when she physically died, her spirit left her body. It existed. It went somewhere. It was going somewhere. And Lord Jesus just called back that spirit, and her spirit returned. Her spirit, which existed, her spirit, which left her body at her physical death, has now returned. And she rose immediately, and he ordered that something be given her her to eat. See, she doesn't have an immortal body right now. That's not a resurrection. Lord Jesus, with his divine power, called back her spirit because when she physically died, she didn't cease to exist. Her spirit, because we're spirits in the bodies of animals. That's what distinguishes us from animals. I'm not saying they don't have a spirit, but we have a spirit made in the image of God, right? We have a spirit that worships God, right? Or is intended to worship God and is intended to dwell with God forever in and, and assist God in judgment of, of the created universe, right? In the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, that's in Revelation chapter 22. We will sit on Lord Jesus' throne. See, Lord Jesus sits on his Father's throne. His Father's throne is the throne of rulership. But then there's a throne of judgment. Remember, the Son does the judgment, and we will sit on that throne with him and do judgment, right? And judge the angels, for example. Job chapter 14. Let's look at verses 10 through 12 before we get to 13 to 15. But a man dies and he's powerless. When a human expires, where is he? Waters disappear from the sea and a river drains away and dries up. By the way, in Job, it's the same thing as I talked about earlier in Ecclesiastes. Job says things that are false. Job's friend says things that are false and Lord God corrects them. So again, things can be stated and inspire writings and God wants us to know those things, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're the truth, Right? What? Only God is perfect. Only Lord Jesus was perfect because he's God, right? Even the great men of the Old Testament, every one of them made errors. Men that Lord God loved, men of his heart like David, for example. Uh, men also lies down and does not get up. Until heaven is no more, they will not wake up, nor will be aroused from their sleep. Right there, that's not true, <laughs> right? That's not true. We just saw um, someone lie down and get aroused from their sleep with Lord Jesus, and we'll see more coming up. Now, verses 13 through 16. 
Oh, that in the grave you would conceal me, that you would hide me until your anger passes by, that you would set a time limit for me and remember me. If a man dies, can he live again? Look, it's a question. The answer is yes. I will wait all the days of my compulsory service until my relief comes. You will call and I will answer you. You will long for the work of your hands, but for now, you keep counting my every step. You watch only for my sin. So none of this uh, contradicts what Lord Jesus said and did and what other scripture states. If you think it does, you're mistaken. And again, people like Solomon say things that aren't true. That's how they felt. That's what they thought. And Lord God wants us to understand what they felt and thought. But that doesn't mean we're to believe that. Like everything is futile. Solomon felt that way. He just wrote those things down multiple times. Does Lord God want us to think that everything is futile? Of course not. Completely the opposite is what he wants us to think. Now, let's look at these resurrections, which aren't resurrections. The only resurrection is the first fruit was Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, when you resurrect, you have an immortal body, right? Only Lord Jesus has that. We will have it in the future. Those of us who are his brothers, who are his sister, who are his mother, who see and believe upon him, for who truly is the divine Son who took on flesh, our Lord and our God, just like Thomas declared in John 20, 28. That is the will of the Father. We see and believe that. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 to 20. After these things, the son of the woman who owned the house fell sick, and his sickness became so severe that he stopped breathing. At this she said to Elijah, What do you have against me, O man of the true God? Have you come to remind me of my guilt and put my son to death? But he said, well, Give me your son. Then he took him from her arms and carried him up to the roof chamber where he was staying, and he laid him on his own bed. He called out to Jehovah, O oh, Jehovah, my God, are you also bringing harm to the widow with whom I am staying by putting her son to death? Verses 21 to 24. Then he stretched himself out over the child three times and called out to Jehovah, Oh, Jehovah, my God, please let this child's life come back into him. Let his spirit return to him. Jehovah listened to Elijah's request and the life of the child came back into him and he revived. See, his spirit came back. Elijah And the spirit existed. The spirit left his body and the spirit returned. Elijah took the child and brought him down from the roof chamber into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son is alive. At that, the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you truly are a man of God and that Jehovah's word in your mouth is true. That's not a resurrection. That boy later died. Okay, If he had a resurrected body, he'd be the first fruits and it wouldn't be Lord Jesus. Right? And, and uh, again, he would be immortal. And of course, he did not have a resurrected body. No one but Lord Jesus has one at this point. Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Soon afterwards, he, Lord Jesus, of course, traveled to a city called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd were waiting with him. As he got near the gate of the city, why look, there was a dead man be carrying out the only son of his mother. Besides, she was a widow. A considerable crowd from the city was also with her. When the Lord caught sight of her, he was moved with pity for her, and he said to her, stop weeping. With that, he approached and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. Then he said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and started to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. So he called back his spirit. Now fear seized them all, and they began to glorify God, saying, A great prophet has been raised up among us, and God has turned his attention to his people. And this news concerning him spread out to all Judea and all the surrounding country. That's not a resurrection. He raised him from the dead. He called back his spirit. His spirit exists. When he died, he didn't cease to exist. When he died, he physically died. And his spirit went somewhere. We even saw that in Ecclesiastes. Where does the spirit go? Does the spirit of man go upwards? The spirit of animals go downward? So, of course, again, there's a distinction between the spirit and the body. We're spirits living in bodies. We're spirits in the bodies of animals, basically, right? That's what makes us distinct. John chapter 11 Verses 39 to 44, again of Lazarus. Jesus said, take the stone away. Martha, the sister of the sea, said to him, Lord, by now you must smell, for it has been four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away. Then Jesus raised his eyes heavenward and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. True, I knew that you always hear me, but I spoke on account of the crowd standing around, so they, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had been dead came out with his feet and hands bound with wrappings and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said, free him and let him go. Again, he called back his spirit. These are raisings from the dead. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I described this earlier. Let's look at it in detail. Verses 13 through 18. Moreover, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who are sleeping in death, so that you may not sorrow as though rest do who have no hope. For if we have faith that Jesus died and rose again, so to God, meaning God the Father, will bring with him, meaning bring with Jesus, right? When he returns, those who have fallen asleep in death through Jesus, right there proves they exist. He's bringing something with him. 
you don't bring something with you unless it exists, right? If, if you're bringing a full purse, there's something in your purse. It's not empty. So he's bringing spirits that exist. For this is what we tell you by Jehovah's Word, that we the living, again, talking about the people living at that time, living in physical bodies, who survived to the presence or who are physically on the earth when Lord Jesus comes, will in no way proceed or come before those who have fallen asleep in death. We saw this in 1 Corinthians 15. First, the bodies are going to rise from the tombs of the dead former believers, meeting with their spirits, which existed, which came down, and then we'll follow them. Verse 16, because the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a commanding call, with an archangel's voice, and with God's trumpet. And those who are dead in union with Christ will rise first, right? The dead bodies will rise first, just like I mentioned. Afterward, we the living who are surviving again will together with them. Who's the them? The them is the dead bodies which rose and connected to their um, spirits that came down with Lord Jesus from the third heaven. And they were converted again into these spiritual, mortal, and corruptible bodies. And we have the same thing ourselves. Be caught away in clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will always be with the Lord. So keep comforting one another with these words. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 2, and then verses 13 through 16, and then verses 39 to 40. Faith is the assured expectation of what is hoped for, the evident demonstration of realities that are not seen. For by means of it, the men of ancient times had witness born to them. He's talking about Old Testament believers, Old Testament individuals who called upon the name of the Lord. Verse 13, in faith, all of these, these Old Testament believers, died, physically died, although they did not receive the fulfillment of the promises, but they saw them from a distance. So what was this promise that they didn't receive? And welcomed them and publicly declared that they were strange and temporary residents in the land, in the physical land of, of Israel. For those who speak in such a way make it evident that they are earnestly seeking a place of their own. And yet, if they had kept remembering the place from which they had departed, they would have had the opportunity to return. But now they are reaching out for a better place. That is one belonging to heaven. Oh, so the place that they were promised was a heavenly place heavenly Jerusalem. Therefore, God is not ashamed of them to be called on as their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Oh, a city has been prepared. So they didn't receive the heavenly city of, so that's, you know, they, they wanted Israel. They wanted the heavenly Israel, not the physical. And then verse 39, and yet all of these, again, referring to these Old Testament believers who called upon the name of the Lord, although they received a favorable witness because of their faith, did not obtain the fulfillment of the promise. What's the fulfillment of the promise? The heavenly Jerusalem. Because God had foreseen something better for us, New Testament believers, so that they, Old Testament believers, might not be made perfect apart from us. So notice we were all going to be made perfect together. They came before us, so they couldn't be made perfect before us. Now we can all be made perfect. What's being made perfect mean? We know what the promise is, the heavenly Jerusalem. This is explained in Hebrews chapter 12. We have verses 1 through 2, and then verses 18 to 23, and then we're done. So then because we, New Testament believers, have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, who are these witnesses? Who is he just speaking of in the verse before that ended chapter 11? He was speaking about Old Testament believers. Witnesses are someone who see us. If they see us, they are existing. Do you understand? So their spirits exist, which we've seen over and over. That's why their witness is a great cloud of them surrounding us, right? They go up in the clouds, they come down in the clouds. There's a cloud of witnesses. Let us also throw off every weight and the sin that easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us as we look intently at the chief agent and perfecter of our faith, Jesus. Oh, he perfects our faith, being made perfect. So Lord Jesus allows our faith, right? Seeing and believing upon the Lord, uh, Jesus, by the way, the divine Son who took on flesh is our Lord and our God, calling upon the name of the Lord, right? For the joy that was set before me endured a torture stake, despising shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God, meaning God the Father, of course. Now verses 18 through 23. If you have not approached something that can be felt, and that has been set aflame with fire, and dark cloud and thick darkness and a storm, and the blast of a trumpet, and the voice speaking words, which on hearing the people begged that nothing further should be spoken to them. What was this? This is when Lord God descended on Mount Sinai with the tablets. Remember, the children of Israel were terrified, for they could not bear the command, these Old Testament believers. If even a beast touches the mountain, it must be stoned. Also, the display was so terrifying that Moses said, I am afraid and trembling. But you have approached a Mount Zion, and a city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem. There it is. 
That's the promise. And myriads of angels and general assembly and the congregation of the firstborn, they're in church in heaven, who have been enrolled in the heavens. And God, the judge of all, meaning God the Father, and the spiritual lives, it just says spirits, by the way, in the Greek manuscript, of righteous ones who have been made perfect. Uh, so being made perfect is being in the third heaven. Now, their spirits in the third heaven, they exist. They're a cloud of witnesses. They're going to come with Lord Jesus at the rapture event we saw in 1 Thessalonians 4 again and again and again. So what JW.org, the Watchtower, teaches that when you die, you cease to exist is explicitly false, shows they do not understand scripture whatsoever. It's very satanic if you think about it. So I pray this was edifying to you if you're a traditional Trinitarian Christian such as myself, and I pray that if you are a member of that wicked cult, it's not your fault, please recognize from what we showed you that these individuals do not teach the truth of the Bible. They teach lies. So either two options. Option number one, they don't understand the Bible. They're not purposely trying to lead you to Satan, but they don't understand it, right? And if they don't understand the way, they can't lead you there. The other possibility is this is somehow satanic, demonic, spiritually intended to steal you from the feet of the true Lord Jesus, the divine Son who took on flesh your Lord and your God, just like he's my Lord and my God. Again, I pray that was edifying to all of you. Amen. I pray I spoke truth and interpretively scripture correctly so that this discussion might have been a blessing to you, the viewer and listener. All truth comes from God. Any errors were my own. If it was a blessing to you, I would greatly appreciate if you could like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Lord willing, we shall meet again. May the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless us all. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.